Okay, good evening, everyone. Hello. It's very nice to see people in person, which I think is really our first proper event. We had a book launch for some unimportant book a few, <laughs> few months ago. Um, and it's been two and a half years or something, I think, since we had a, an event like this. Um, the, the series is going to normally be online, but today it's my, it's my great pleasure to be introducing Professor Johannes Bronckhorst, who is Emeritus Professor of Sanskrit Studies at University of Lausanne, is that, is that correct? And needs, I mean, it's not often when I, I say this, but it really does need no introduction to anyone in the field of yoga studies, but I shall say a few words. We've just been talking, he's actually had quite a long uh, engagement with SOAS over the years. First time was 38 years ago when he was the replacement Sanskrit lecturer. And then uh, in the late 90s, he came for a five day Seminary, but maybe you don't remember, but Matthew remembers very clearly. And in fact, Matthew wrote a bio, which is still on the SOAS website. I will read a couple of bits out from it. Where was it? Um, Bronckhorst's own commitment to rational debate and his studies on practices and debates in the Indian philosophical context continue to provide profound insight and enormous stimulation for students of ancient India. And that was 25 years ago, and it's still going on because you're, you know, Professor Bronckhorst has put out some of the big theories in our field that, you know, whether you agree with them or not, you have to engage with them. Okay, I think many of us will know that already. Matthew continued, besides wide ranging contributions towards a deeper understanding of Indian grammatical traditions, Bronckhorst's extensive knowledge of Indian languages and texts, a thoroughly logical approach to his material, and a penchant for clear, bold, and sometimes controversial hypotheses have earned him a unique place in Indological studies. Um, I didn't try to add it all up, but I think uh, Professor Bronkhorst has published over 100 articles and a dozen, 15 books, something like that, amongst which I will mention the ones that are particularly significant for yoga studies, uh, the two traditions of meditation in ancient India and the two sources of ancient Indian asceticism. And then, of course, uh, there's the, the greater Magadha theory, and Professor Bronkhorst was sort of honoured with a large conference, was it last year, of people coming to discuss and respond to this extremely uh, important and influential theory about uh, early religion in India. And then since then, his most recent book is called How the Brahmins Won. But today, we're going to be talking about something slightly different, I suppose, from those, those, uh, those themes, the psychology of yoga, as you can see. So... Um, over to you, Professor Bronckhorst, and yeah. hope there'll be time for a few questions and so forth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Well, thank you very much for this um, flattering introduction. And of course, I'm going to speak about something that I have absolutely no competence in today. So don't expect too much from me. I'm not a professional psychologist, and perhaps therefore I should start with an apology why should I come to this wonderful center and uh, speak about um, something that I does not is not part of my field of expertise? The answer is very simple. It is that professional psychologists have not, to my knowledge yet, dealt with the issue I wish to address today. So if among you, there are professional psychologists and you find that there are lacunas in my uh, presentation, I'll be most grateful to learn from you. And in general, I do hope that the remarks I make today may one day inspire more competent people to deal with the issues I'm going to raise. Now, uh, as a whole, I like to make two points today in my presentation. Um, as a philologist, I'm a philologist. It means someone who reads texts. That's a wonderful occupation, and you can feel really protected from the world with your texts and not worry about anything else that's going on in the world and other forms of knowledge that are being produced. Now, my first point is that is not justified. It's too cozy not to pay attention to other 
developments that in, in other fields of specialization, for example, the sciences, we need to at least superficially keep an eye on what's going on. Sometimes this can help us in our philological work, and I'll give an illustration of that in a minute. And there is another point. If you study religious texts, you're almost obliged to not to take everything you read too literally. You cannot believe everyone's myths and other stories. You have to take a lot of that with a grain of salt, so to say, or rather you want feel you have to perhaps interpret it symbolically or metaphorically. Now there is, that is necessary. There is no alternative to that. But let us not be too keen on finding symbolical and meta metaphorical interpretations of texts, which actually are pretty straightforward. The first choice will always have to be to read a text and take it literally as long as you can. Very, very often, that is not for very long, I know, but we should not forget that it is always the first interpretation of a text. We take it literally. Okay, I said um, I will give a little um, illustration, which personally I like, of a way in which awareness of modern scientific developments can help us sometimes make more sense of an ancient text. And for this example, I don't take something from India. I will get to India in a minute, so don't be impatient. I will go to, um, let me see if I can know how to work this. This, no. Anyway. Yeah, something, yeah, from a um, Chinese report written about a thousand years ago in which a court astronomer points out that at a certain time, a certain year, um, which actually corresponds to the year 1054, um, someone observed a guest star had appeared. That means this report tells us of a new star that appeared in the sky. That happens occasionally in history, and that is in some at some occasions actually reported. Now, if you read the rest of this um, passage, you see that the astronomer was rather concerned about what that would mean for the dynasty if something very important was being announced through the stars. And all that can, of course, historically be studied and may turn out to be extremely interesting. However, you can also say, well, very good, that's what the Chinese observer made of it and his colleagues. But what happens if we nowadays look at that point in the sky and see what there was to be seen? And if one does that, we get this. This is what people see nowadays through a telescope if they aim it at the spot mentioned in these early Chinese reports. It is what they call a crab nebula, the crab nebula. And what is that? Well, Wikipedia can tell you what it is. The crab nebula is a supernova remnant and pulsar wind nebula and so on. That means about a thousand years ago, a star actually exploded. It's called called supernova doesn't matter how that works and why the mechanism at this moment doesn't interest us but we do see that these chinese they saw something new in the sky they thought it had a bearing on their uh, dynasty or other political developments but we with our modern knowledge we see that a particular astronomical event took place or had taken place, it always takes a while before light reaches the earth, 
And so we can add to what we find in the old text. So that is my point. Me occasionally, by being aware of modern developments, modern science, or whatever else it may be, can help us make more sense or deeper understanding of what early texts say. Now, as you know, I'm going to speak today about the psychology of yoga. And briefly, of course, I will look with you at some texts from early Buddhism and from what is called classical yoga. And of course, these texts have their own ideas about what to make of the information they provide. That's in itself terribly interesting, and many colleagues write books about that. Buddhist psychology, yogic psychology, how these the authors of these books made sense of the experiences they consider. Today, I'm not going to look at that, not interested today. And like in the case of the Crab Nebula, I'm going to say to see if modern science can help us interpret texts, perhaps in a way that is different from what we find in the early texts. So this by way of introduction, and I now we get into the nitty gritty. Freedom. Freedom is a central notion in many schools of Indian thought and religious thought. Freedom is a central notion in many religious and philosophical movements of classical India. It usually concerns freedom from rebirth and karmic retribution. That is the underlying conviction of virtually all the schools of thoughts we can consider that after this life, we may be we reborn in the next life. And the, the details of this next life are determined by what we have been doing in the present life. Karmic retribution, rebirth and karmic retribution. Now, freedom from that mechanism is a shared goal of many uh, schools of Indian thought. Certain movements, however, uh, usually uh, now, when, if one reaches that goal, when does that happen? In most cases, in the case of most thinkers of the classical period, that happens at death. That means you live the right life, you do the right thing, you reach the goal, and that means you die. Afterwards, you're free, you will not be reborn. Um, however, there are certain movements in classical India, India still, they, which accept that freedom can be attained while one is still alive by undergoing a transformation. These few schools, actually they are a minority at that period, they maintain that a transformation can take place in a human being as a result of which that human being will not be reborn, yes, but there will also be other, uh, let's say, psychological changes that have taken place in that person. So a consequence of this tradition, it, as a consequence of this transformation, which is thought to be permanent and irreversible, the person concerned still alive is now liberated and the transformation concerned is often of a mental or psychological nature the person still alive is a different person it's not only that he will not be reborn but the remainder of his life is will be um he of course the text almost always speak of men so i will say he theoretically we could include women but the texts do not often do so um will be a different person well there we are there are claims in certain texts of ancient india about 
trend, psychological transformations. Well, psychological transformations are the business of psychology. The question which I wish to address is, can modern knowledge about psychological transformations help us understand some of the early Indian texts better? Well, what does modern psychology know about permanent and irreversible transformations? Classical forms of psychotherapy, and of course we think in the first place here of Freudian psychoanalysis, but there are many other forms of uh, psychotherapy, they assumed, and I use the past tense, assumed that certain permanent psychological changes can be brought about in human beings, but ne neuroscientists tended to remain skeptical. So there was a difference of opinion between the therapists and the neuroscientists. The therapists thought they could bring about permanent and irreversible changes, and the neuroscientists would say, well, hold on, it may not be all that definite. Um, so the neuroscientists held that essential psychological features, including those based on the memories that contributed to the formation of our personalities, were laid down in unchangeable synaptic connections between neurons. This is slightly technical if you come from a philological background, you have to bear with me and get perhaps the gist of what I'm talking about. Uh, I have to pass this on to you in order to have a basis for, the fur for further discussions. Now this conviction that actually these the memories of um, features that were to be changed were actually maintained, they were still there, and that no amount of therapy could change that, this conviction itself has now changed. During the last 20 years or so, a discovery has found its way into neuroscience and psychology that is known by the name memory consolidation. Do I have that somewhere here? Yes, memory reconsolidation. That is the key term to which I will uh, return a number of times. And indeed, this was a big thing in psychology. I one researcher said, for example, in 2012, she said, this is one of the hottest new theories in the past decade. Now we are again 10 years further, but it's still very much the discussed thing and I will explain briefly what it is all about. Experiments on animals and subsequently on humans revealed that during a short while after the reactivation of memories their emotional contents can be permanently modified. Um, this short period is the reconsolidation window and lasts from perhaps a few minutes or up to a few hours, but after that it's over and the window closes. So, and during the reconsolidation window, a change, a permanent change in the emotional aspect of um, uh, memories can be brought about in various ways. In experiments on animals, pharmacological substances are used. For example, you can um, condition a rat. A rat, you put it in a certain place, and the rat will learn very soon that in that place, soon it will get an electric shock in its feet. You take the rat out, later you put it back in the place, and the rat will freeze. The rat knows this is a dangerous place and something horrible is going to happen to me. That is conditioning. And the rat has a conditioned response to um, this disagreeable event. 
the ne if the next time you put the red in that position, that means the red remembers now the previous bad experience, but at the same time, you give it something which is called a protein synthesis inhibitor. That means a medical substance which does not allow certain proteins to form in the um, in the uh, places where they are normally formed to create memories. And what happens? You give the rat this inhibitor, and from then onward, the rat is not afraid to go into that place. The, the emotional side of the memory has completely disappeared. It's no longer there. Um, and you can do what you like, it will not come back. It's destroyed. Well, you can think this is chemical stuff, who cares? But the same thing, a bit differently, can be carried out on human beings with chemicals, yes, but also without chemicals, namely by the, the, the clue is memories have to be reactivated. For example, a person has a horrible memory of a bad experience they had and the next time um, something happens that reminds them of that earlier experience and they the memory will be reactivated the fear or whatever it is will come back but if during the window of opportunity the human being is then exposed to a completely different um, situation psychologists then speak of a mismatch or prediction error, and after that, the reactivated memory is no longer accompanied by its expected outcome. Um, indeed, I quote, therapeutic change in a variety of modalities, including behavioral therapy and all kinds of other forms of therapy, I will not bother you with it, results from the updating of prior emotional memories through a process of reconsolidation that incorporates new emotional experiences. Now, because this is um, a really major breakthrough, something really very important in, in our understanding of um, the memory and conditioning and opens up a possibility to the, what they call erasure of emotional memories. I will stay with it on a few more minutes before I will talk to things that you may find more appealing. So I will give a quotation from one um, publication and read it with you a common non-pharmacological technique to change conditioned emotional reactions is what they call extinction training extinction involves recurrent presentations of the conditioned stimulus without aversive or appetitive outcomes so that means normally you can put the rat back into the place where it had these bad experiences before, but this time it doesn't have the bad experience, but you do just any time and you do that long enough. And what will happen? The rat slowly, slowly will no longer freeze, uh, show fear um, in that particular situation. However, the memory trace of the bad experience will normally still be there and you can revive it rather easily by repeating the bad experience and that's why in, in um, italics we read there is abundant evidence that standard extin extinction training results in an additional memory trace representing an alternative for the conditioned stimulus that means in our hypothetical rat 
there will be on the one hand the memory of the horrible experience and on the other hand there will be the memory of the good experience and the two memories exist side by side and if the good experience has been repeated often enough slowly slowly the rats will tend to forget the bad experience but the memory the bad memory is still there and that can be shown it has not been removed it is still but memory 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 reconsolidation brings in something different altogether let you read here no where is it however if extinction training occurs during reconsolidation while the memory is still labeled that means it happens the memory is reactivated and during this short period that the memory is reactivated it is possible that this new information will get incorporated into the original memory trace thus updating the original emotional memory and changing its emotional significance and the result is a total change and irreversible uh, transformation of the response to that bad experience and that's why I'll give you one more passage of a uh, therapist who works with who tries to apply this discovery in his practice he says defining complete elimination of there's a complete elimination of unwanted emotional responses as the goal of psychotherapy is a statement that no neuroscientist would have ventured to make prior to 2000. I remind you, I talk about a discovery that's about 20 years old. It was made around 2000, before the discovery of memory reconsolidation. It is a goal now recognized as a possibility grounded in empirical research that goal is the operational definition of erasure so there are two terms here extinction which is a very confusing term because actually extinction does not mean that something is completely extinct but it is still there but pushed into the background but erasure means total removal from the memory bank um, and what is erasure lasting effortless complete cessation under all circumstances of an unwanted behavior state of mind and or somatic disturbance that have occurred either continuously or in response to certain contacts or cues now I think uh I've bothered you with enough of this kind of stuff I hope you understand that as obscure as it may seem this is a major development a major discovery in the functioning of the human mind there is a way to remove the emotional charge of memories definitely without leaving a trace in practice it's not always easy and of course it's the task of a therapist to find ways of dealing with all the practical problems but the literature around this is quite big and in principle there is no doubt that this is now a new development in psychology so this is in short what is known about memory consolidation and the way it can bring about permanent and irreversible changes in the human and animal psyche. Can it help us understand early Indian texts that speak about such changes? Now, before I continue, I have to warn you. Um, I certainly do not claim that the practices which we are going to consider and which uh, 
we find described in certain Buddhist texts and certain yogic texts, I'm not claiming that they are a form of psychotherapy. And for those of you who are not um, historical scholars, let me also point out that when I use yoga, I talk about texts that are not related to what you may do at your yoga school. That is the text from a much earlier period, which are very little concerned with bodily positions, but very much with bringing about mental changes. Um, just to keep things clear. I, so these practices, as they, at least as they are described in early Indian texts, were not a form of therapy. People did not say, oh, I'll become a yogi because I have a, a, a symptom the, for which he would nowadays perhaps go to a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Their goal is different. And in fact, their goal is a lot more radical than what any um, modern psychologist would dare to promise or uh, to their um, patients. And therefore, also the practitioner of these practices, they are not patients. That's another difference because these practices are described as being carried out alone without uh, the presence of um, um, a therapist. Now, okay. Um, I repeat that the idea that freedom can be attained before death is not omnipresent in Indian texts. In more recent texts, it becomes more common, but in the earlier texts, it is actually quite rare. And um, the two kinds of texts to which I will draw your attention are first um, texts from the early Buddhist canon, and second, some texts from the so-called Patanjala, Yoga, the Yoga Sutra, and Yoga Bhashya, whose name you certainly have all heard, but that you may not have read. Mm. The Buddhist texts are quite elaborate on describing how to, so the Buddhist texts, they talk about, they don't use the term liberation in life. It's not a matter of terminology, but they do say that in principle, the goal, freedom from rebirth, but also freedom from suffering and freedom from desire can be reached while one is still alive. And the question is, they describe how one can attain that. And what I wish to explore is, does this method, can we understand this, this, their descriptions better in the light of what I've just discussed about memory um, uh, reconsolidation? I have to sum up things to a minimum. We all know that Buddhism has a lot to do with meditation. What not so many people realize that, as, at least as far as the early Buddhist texts are concerned, meditation is not the goal. Meditation is um, a means to get somewhere where the transformation can be brought about. Um, that is to say, no Buddhist text, or at least not the text that I consider today, would say that if you meditate at some point, that will bring you freedom or the end of suffering or the end of desire by itself. Meditation along with many other things, are preparatory practices. In fact, there is one long passage, covers quite a number of pages, which is repeated 
any number of times in the old texts which describe how a person supposedly reaches the goal and that starts with indeed abandoning everything one has abandoning one's uh, house and family and children um, and then um, living an extremely simple life and then two elements come to the fore and one is a term that you all know namely mindfulness mindfulness is i repeat is not a goal it is a step on the path that leads to the situation where the practitioner hopefully can bring about the transformation now mindfulness that is being aware of everything one does and then other element that becomes very important um, is what I call mental absorption. Mindfulness and mental absorption are important ingredients of the meditation in Buddhism. But I repeat, mindfulness and uh, mental absorption do not bring you the desired result it gets you into a state where according to the text you can do the needful but if you don't you've got to nowhere you've just had a meditative experience i think that's so important because i have the feeling that nowadays everyone talks about buddhism and this is so often overlooked the all these practices are there to reach a goal, there are no goal in themselves. So the culminating part in this long passage that is repeated so often in the canon, I have, um, I give you an English translation. Here it is. In this particular passage, it is put in the mouth of the historical Buddha. Sometimes the same thing is put in someone else's mouth. Doesn't matter. The, um, the main thing is always the same. And I read it with you. Then, that means then, after all these preparatory practices, when my mind was thus absorbed, pure, cleansed, free from blemish, without stain, supple, ready, firm, immovable. That's a bit stylistic way of the ancient scriptures to present things with lots of synonyms then I directed my mind that's the Buddha who's supposed to speak here I directed my mind to the knowledge of the destruction of the influxes don't ask me what that is and we'll come back to that then I recognized in accordance with reality this is suffering I recognized in accordance with reality this is the origin of suffering I recognized in accordance with reality, this is the cessation of suffering. I recognized in accordance with reality, this is the path leading to the cessation of suffering. I recognized in accordance with reality, these are the influxes. I recognized this is the origin of the influxes. I recognized this is the cessation of the influxes. I recognize this is the path leading to the cessation of the influxes. Now, if you ask me honestly, if what I think of this, what I thought when I read it to the first time, I thought this is gobbledygook. This says absolutely nothing. It says a few things, which it repeats, and um, it gives no indication at all of what is going on. Um, the question is, can we, with our present knowledge of uh, memory reconsolidation, perhaps make some sense of this? Can we at least propose what these influxes, and the term is asrava, that's the, 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 the Sanskrit term, and uh, what that is, no one really knows. And I have the feeling this, this passage was as obscure to many Buddhists as it is to us it doesn't say much and we have if we assume that it really refers to something that happened because afterwards 
the text will go on and say, the Buddha will then say, okay, then I had done the job, it was all finished, and now I uh, have the end of suffering and all that. So this passage supposedly tells us something about a mental transformation, but by reading it just like that, we have we gain very little insight about what it is. So my question is, can we impose some sense on it with the help of our new understanding of memory reconsolidation? And I think perhaps we can. I'm going to propose that we can. We have to make, however, two assumptions. The first is that the practice of meditation here set forth can facilitate access to mental contents, especially memories and their networks that are normally not, e not normally easily accessible to consciousness. Remember what we discovered about memory reconsolidation? We to bring it about, we need not only to remember the memories, but we have to reactivate them in their full emotional strength. That is essential. Just the memory is not good enough. But how do we get access to hidden memories that may have an influence on the personalities we are, that may influence our behavior, our personalities, but which are often hidden below the surface. We don't know why or how. Access to that is vital. Otherwise, we cannot apply memory reconsolidation. So the question is, do these meditational practices allow access to memories along with their emotional dimension that are not normally easily accessible? Um, the second assumption we have to make is that if so, and if these are accessed, that um, these memories can be emptied of their emotional charges. Uh, that is not surprising. We have seen that is what memory consolidation is all about. Once there is access and once the memory, perhaps painful and in any case, emotional memory is confronted with a different uh, reality, it can be erased. That means the emotional elements can be taken away from it. But the question therefore remains, do the meditational practices give access to those memories and their emotions? Um, well, mindfulness certainly helps. In fact, many modern psychotherapists in order to dive into the, the problems of a person who comes with a complaint, they use often mindfulness that helps finding memories that are not so easily accessible otherwise. So the mindfulness is quite, has obviously its place here. The other thing I mentioned is, uh, at least as important, but at the same time, perhaps slightly problematic, that is uh, mental absorption. Mental absorption has not, and we talk here about uh, mental absorption can be of various depth. At least that is how it is presented in these texts. And obviously the mental absorption has to be very deep in order to bring about the effects uh, that it is uh, that it is used for. Mm. Mental absorption does not play attract very much attention in, to my knowledge, in modern psychological research. There is some interest in, perhaps you've heard of it, flow, F L O W. Uh, the kind of mental state people get in if they do something that is agreeable and, and uh, the, in which they forget the time, they forget everything. And there is no doubt a form of uh, mental absorption, even though not a particularly deep one. 
And that there is quite a number of articles being published about flow, but for the rest, um, mental absorption has not attracted all that much attention to my knowledge in the psychological literature. But if we go by texts like this, it is a vital ingredient for digging up uh, memories and emotions that are not normally easily available. So to sum up, these two elements in particular, apparently we can consider that they are used to gain access to uh, emotional experiences. Once the access is there through memory reconsolidation, they can be erased. And if we accept this, then we have some kind of made some amount of sense of a passage in the Buddhist canon, which, as I said, at first sight looks like gobbledygook. Um, I think I will jump to um, a few passages from the Yoga Sutra and Yoga Bhashya. I suppose you've all heard of that. Uh, the name of the author supposedly is Patanjali. There is some difficulties with the nature of the text. How many authors did it have? Is it perhaps a collection of parts that brought together? Um, nonetheless, it has come down as the classical text of yoga, of classical yoga. And if you go through it, as I did, you come across a few passages that are rather um, tempting to interpret in the light of what I have been presenting to you. Let me see. Oh, I think. <coughs> um, here is one. So we turn to a different text, to a different philosophy or a different psychology, different ways in which the, the text tries to make sense of what it describes. Um, but the experience um, is interesting. We see here, for example, when the yogi has attained the insight connected with absorption, absorption, always absorption, and all these Indian texts, absorption is extremely important. Um, the mental trace of that insight comes about anew and anew. And then the sutra says the mental trace born from that insight impedes other mental traces. Now that's interesting. That is a bit what we were uh, finding in um, memory reconsolidation. There is a memory of a certain type. It is reactivated and a different, at least an emotionally different memory, memory is put in its place. So it's quite tempting to interpret this particular sutra along those lines. So one mental train, uh, trace impedes other mental traces and uh, presumably replaces it. So then the commentary goes into some details, which I will skip because I would, as you asked, try to have some time for discussion. Here, another of the Yoga Sutras, which says, if the seeds of someone's afflictions have been burned, those afflictions will not be re will not be awakened, even if they are confronted with that on which they rest. Now, this can be easily interpreted exactly in terms of memory reconsolidation. Memory reconsolidation says, if a memory trace has been erased, it will not be reawakened even if you are confronted with the same situation that gave you pain or pleasure before. 
this is almost a translation of that. Uh, if the seeds of someone's afflictions have been burned, uh, we supposedly a, a, a mental process removes them, erases those traces, then those afflictions will not be awakened, even if they are confronted with that on which they rest. I found that a particularly interesting uh, sutra and perhaps significant and perhaps um, I like to interpret that as an indication that at least some of the people involved in the production of these texts were aware of this particular psychological mechanism. I will have to say more about it in a minute, but I go to one more example. As a result of perceiving the mental traces, there is knowledge of earlier lives. Now, this, of course, is uh, can once again is lends itself very easily to an interpretation along the lines of memory reconsolidation, because reactivating a memory means remembering the situation in which. Um, remembering the whole, the whole situation in which something occurred that left its traces. Now, of course, in the Indian context, people will talk about earlier lives. We don't have to convert to that. We don't have to accept that. But to um, we can accept that crucial reactivated memories do call back memories of situations that had so far been forgotten and that is exactly what this particular sutra seems to be saying well there are one has to be careful with what i've been saying i've been proposing a way of trying to interpret early texts in a way that perhaps makes more sense or that allows us to understand better what is going on. I have not found many more passages that fit this interpretation so easily. There are lots of Indian texts that talk about mental absorption, for example, but there are not so many Indian texts that use mental absorption as a precondition, as a preliminary to a transformation. I'm ready to be corrected and to be updated with respect to more recent yoga texts, and I'm in the right place here to learn about that. But in the earlier literature, that is quite rare. And I also like to point out that um, we should um, take this approach. We have to be very careful. We should not impose an interpretation on all possible texts. Um, and mine, of course, is tentative, but I found it the more little passages like the ones I share with you found, the more tempting it became to me to think not that all those guys so many centuries ago knew what memory reconsolidation was, but at least some did actually have an awareness of that and used it. Yeah, about the Yoga Sutra and Yoga Bhashya, as I said, the, it is, of course, what you, people tell always is the Yoga Sutra is composed by Patanjali, and then there is this commentary, the Bhashya, composed by Vyasa. Of course, this is a very late tradition. For centuries after its composition, no one knew who this Vyasa was of, and so on. It's, it's quite clear that the text is a composition. We don't know who put it all together. And we do know that some passages strongly suggest that at least the collector himself had very little yogi practice and did not know all that well, perhaps what he was talking about. 
But then at the same time, he brought texts together. And as I've tried to show you now, some passages do suggest that they give expression to mental processes which may have been known and proce processed. I think I stop now. I've been occupying your attention for almost an hour, and um, we should leave a little time for perhaps a discussion. Thank you. Um, so do you want to take the questions from here? Shall I come and take them? I, I, well, I'll, 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 anyway, the chair's privileged. I've got lots and lots of questions, but I, <laughs> Good. I shall try to limit myself to one. You won't need to hear a few of those. Okay. Right. Pass it around, chuck it around. Um, you, you said that meditation is not the the end, for, you know, the end of the goal. Um, and that then more needs to be done from uh, as a result of uh, after practicing meditation. But in the context of uh, both Patanjali, and I think as you were saying about modern psychiatry, but I wasn't sure I completely understood that, it seemed to me that it resulted automatically that from meditation, samadhi, which is presumably what you meant by absorption, arose. And then was it 150 said that new sanskaras would appear and they would suppress any other kinds of sanskara, anya sanskara. So that to me sounded like an automatic process as though it would just happen automatically in meditation. And similarly, it wasn't clear to me that this uh, moment of reconsolidation as the modern psychiatrist called it, um, how that came about, whether that was a conscious process i did well i wasn't clear what state that uh the, the reconsolidation could happen in and whether that was something one had to do willfully and deliberately or again if it just somehow happens or yes to start with your second remark yes i think that's of the essence of it a, a reactivated memory is a consciously remembered memory and if it's not consciously remembered nothing happens mm -hmm. so th that's for sure it has to be willfully consciously carried out that uh, seems to be the case in, in modern psychiatry and i like to think in the case of the text we consider the first question well um at least the buddhist texts are or at least the passages that i've considered are very explicit about it the meditation is preliminary to the actual process which is described in these rather obscure terms but it comes after once the um abs mental absorption has been fully reached and so on then the mind can do this and this and that if in the you thought that in yoga sutra 150 uh it's sounds as if it automatically comes about that may be so and but then um point is i uh, take the whole yoga shastra as as a composition and therefore not necessarily in every point completely um well i don't want to say reliable but it, is, it shows the result of pieces that have been brought together so to say so not completely coherent yeah. in, in any case the the connection the the approach which i propose um needs a separation between the preliminary the getting into the right state of mind and then carrying out this process which is reactivating memories and then confronting them with a different reality and so on as i described yeah. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you very much. Daniel, please follow up on that. Yeah, just to follow up on Jim's second question, I'm not, maybe I misunderstood it, but uh, 
I thought he was asking what else had to be present in the uh, psychotherapeutic process. Obviously, the memory is activated. He gave the example of pharmacological uh, inputs. But in the cases where those are not present, what else is applied to bring about the transformation in the face of the reactivated yes, memory? It is, uh, what is the term, prediction, um, mismatch or prediction error. That means the person reactivates a, me a memory, which suppose goes back to an event that was really disagreeable, may also have been the opposite, but disagreeable. It expects when the memory comes up, this disagreeable event to repeat itself, but in fact, it doesn't. That is mismatch or more technically, prediction error. That is the, the crucial thing as uh, psychologists describe the process. Does that answer your question? Sorry, to the question of whether, you know, meditation in itself is also perhaps achieving that function. And certainly in the context of the Yoga Shastra, that's the implication uh, and that follows directly from the realization of insight. Of course, one should never squabble about words. If you want to call that meditation too, then okay, then we have no, to. No, I don't want to call but, that meditation. I just want, I want, I want the, what the, the psychotherapists call it. The, med the, the therapists, they don't use the word meditation. They use quite different terms and different methods. But I tried, I specified that by meditation here, now I meant primarily, um, um, how do you call it, uh, sati? Um, mindfulness, sorry. Sometimes mindfulness and mental absorption. These two by themselves resolve nothing. Something else comes on. Now, if you call that also meditation, fine with me, but that is just a matter of words. Well, those are two different contexts, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, the, the yoga texts as I pointed out in the beginning, have their own way of visualizing, of, they have their own philosophy, or if you like, um, uh, psychology to give this all a place. And uh, it's the Sankhya philosophy, one has to realize that oneself is different from, from everything else and so on. Um, I have on purpose avoided all these issues. I don't want to enter into their philosophical understanding. I want to, to the extent possible, get to the practices they describe. And they fit better, I think, with the uh, memory uh, reconsolidation and than the philosophy, the Sankhya philosophy underlying it. Just to get into the weeds of Sankhya, it's just that. Uh... If I remember correctly, I might get my quote wrong, but the kleshas uh, are removed by meditation. The Yoga Shastra came. Whereas, obviously, in the, the, the Buddhist situation, the result of meditation is the ability to remove the whole pain. I, I don't know quite. Do you think that somewhere they say that the kleshas are removed by? Uh, well, that is a matter of opening the textbooks and, and looking at more closely, then it becomes rather detailed. <laughs> Sorry, I, I don't think it says such a thing, but okay. It's me. <laughs> oh, hello. Um, I just think it's miraculous, really, that I, mean, I thought your lecture was really interesting, but it's miraculous that this path has had the same effect even though the science and the psychology wasn't possible in these times of uh, development of the yoga path. Um, and now we have neuroplasticity and we know that the path, if you use the yamas and niyamas, it leads to these leaps of psychological awareness. And I just think it's a miracle that um, that path of thousands of years ago, it still has this extraordinary um, power on our modern processes. That's all I wanted to say. <laughs> well, thank, thank you. you. But of course, we are psychologically pretty much the same beings as 
the people who wrote these ancient texts and so um i personally feel less convinced by the theoretical constructions they built perhaps based on their experiences or or based on something else but i think the experiences which they some of them had and cultivated and in some cases described are interesting and they remain interesting if we look at them in the light of more recent development so yes to that extent i agree with you Um, I'm coming over to the. I've just got one one comment actually. Sorry, one more because you did say about these Hatha Yoga texts, the te the more modern texts, and I yeah. don't think they address these things very clearly. Although there was one thing that, and I'm, but I, but I shall now look at you know because every time you reread a text, you mm -hmm. see more. But what they do, what a few of the texts say is it is simply by extending the duration of the meditation, which is normally based upon holding the breath, that you advance through the higher stages. So it does seem to imply that the higher states and presumably this ultimate erasure Era erasure was the best better than extinction or it yeah. sounds like the yeah, way yeah. Around, erasure, yeah. but um that that would happen just through extended states rather than yeah. doing anything more deliberate if that makes sense but perhaps I, I can add it. something here of course um we talk about mental absorption as if that is the easy bit but I think that is precisely the bit where most people get stuck it is well first of all we all have the faculty of concentration a little bit more a little bit less when we read a book a bit more and um, when we are in a cocktail party a bit less or something like that but the idea first of all that this capacity of concentration can be deeper and deeper is already something which not everyone would agree with but which i am deeply convinced is the case and to get into deeper states of concentration but i prefer here to use the word absorption is not obvious and many of these texts seem to take it more or less for granted that you have to try and try and practice and practice and hope you get there and I'm sure that there have been countless number of practitioners who have tried all their life and never succeeded and that they never got anywhere near memory reconsolidation because they were trying to get into deeper state of absorption, which I think is an obstacle for most people who try meditation. But... Um, we're joined online by uh, the lovely Lubomir Andraka, and he has a question for you, which is, at the beginning, you said that the attainment to Jivan Mukti is a psychological change of the individual, but isn't it more of an ontological change? My simple answer is no, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's very much a sign, but yeah. people use terms differently. So once again, squabbling over words is a waste of time. Uh, but ontologically in the sense of what they are physically chemically and all that there is no change foreseen i think or hardly <laughs> i don't quite get what you say Can you read out the Sanskrit to me? Have you got it? Yeah, because I would like to know what they say. Yeah. Okay. Well, they can't use the meditation. It's actually a Greek word, but it should be a proper. Yeah, that's proper why I want the Sanskrit word. What what is the Sanskrit word for that? Okay. Let's give Daniel a few moments and land it with us. Yeah, a bit on a different note. I'm not going to quabble over Sanskrit trust. Uh, it's the question that in some ways this is very optimistic because one might be able to actually remove the seeds of affliction and it's very hopeful. On the other hand, I hear in it um, a lot of the, the the rhetoric that we hear today when, when people experience trauma or violence in yogic and guru environments, which says you're only experiencing that because you're not advanced enough in your practice or you're not um, enough of a dharmic uh, aficionado in order to be able to clear that shlisha. so maybe if 
do you see that or or how maybe you, could you respond or do you have any ideas so you say that certain modern yoga teachers would give this response to people who suffer from traumas mm -hmm. but i know to begin with nothing about modern yoga at all so i don't claim any expertise whatsoever but the way you tell it you ask my opinion this is nonsense the, i mean people are affected by traumas they more than anyone else can profit from the 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 kind of um reconsolidation i mentioned they suffer from memories memories which are often hard to access they have to be accessed the trauma has to be relived and um, uh, then there is hope that it may be um, undone erased to say i don't know what kind of yoga your yoga teacher would would propose but i think as long as these elements are not entering into play that sounds to me quite frankly rather dangerous nonsense i think the key for me in understanding something of the landscape that amanda's talking about is what you were saying about the reduction of these processes to mere mindfulness which is i think what we see in the contemporary arena in particular is the reduction of long-term complex practices that that take a lot of effort and a lot of time to kind of you know five week and mindfulness based stress reduction classes or whatever and the idea being that somehow people are supposed to reach this kind of reconsolidation from very watered down versions of these practices and for me that that's one of the real lessons i can apply from your lecture to the contemporary context is that these this memory reconsolidation may be a factor here but it is a factor of very difficult and very long-term complex practices rather than something that everyone should be able to do you know with a few hours of tuition basically you you may very well be right and of course it sounds very simple a few hours practice but you have to get there first yeah. and getting there is often the hard bit in the case of traumatic experiences there is often such a resistance against such memories people will never get to them because their whole body and mind will revolt against it if of course the slow path in a way at some point it has to be convinced that at least if the theory i present is correct there is at some point a reactivation and then there is about two three hours to get the job done and if you don't you have to come back another time because then you have failed for that occasion but as i repeat i'm not a psychologist i just repeat what i read that's how it looks to me i've got one but just to add to that did, did, did you not mention that with psych psychologists they suggested that pharmacological approaches could bring about these states which sounds like the easy option yeah they have tried that a bit they've a lot with animals of course you can't much psychologize with the rats or dogs um they have done um with this uh, um, protein synthesis prohibitor prohibitors many of those are dangerous so you cannot use them in the case of humans there is one called propafonol i think that has been used with humans and uh, to show that the mechanism works but i don't think it has been applied on a large scale and i'm afraid that I don't know what the details are perhaps permissions and other things you're not allowed to put any chemical into a person's brain my, my patanjali's aushadis have helped in this case but <laughs> yes that's right Uh, thank you for your talk it was really stimulating um I just wanted to ask what your thoughts were when looking at um old Buddhist worldview the idea of materiality mentality being the same thing 
and then compar comparing that to psychology where we break down psychological processes as either physiological or neurological or psychological where they don't see mentality and materiality as the same mm. how do we create that bridge between modern psychology and those ancient worldviews that we have in Buddhism, early Buddhism. I'm just interested in your thoughts on yeah. that. Of course, the Buddhists have maintained a tradition, which I think from early days, they have not always fully understood. The great, great service to us is that they, think that they preserved it orally, in writing, and so on. But there are like passages that I showed. I think Buddhists have mm. preserved the passage, but I don't think there were many who had a clue what it was about. Mm. And um, so I am not so much tempted to, and I know Buddhism has developed wonderful philosophical ideas. It was a source of ideas in the whole of classical India. From a historical point of view, it's it's a gold mine, but I'm not really inclined to kind of follow them. I think they tried their best with the materials they had. They're interesting to study, and I've spent a lot of time trying to make sense of it. Um, but it is not my philosophy. We live in a modern world. We know more, and thank goodness, knowledge progresses uh, sometimes. Um, too slow, sometimes two steps forward, one step back, and so on. But by and large, what we know about the world today is infinitely more than what the authors of those texts knew about the world in general. Now, of course, it is nowadays in the research on neuropsychology, it's a major issue how to make sense of the mental world. If we only concentrate on the, the chemistry of the brain, where does where do feelings come from? And where does consciousness fit in? <clears throat> but as a matter of fact, this is a really, really hot topic nowadays. And the number of publications on that is enormous. It, it's not up to me to give a simple answer and say, this is the simple answer, or we can forget all about it. Um, what the question you raise is important, but is not nowadays neglected. It was for too long, but now there are many serious scholars and scientists who turn to it and who discuss it, and the, the literature is vast. And I recommend you to, to look at it. You will find interesting things. Yeah. Thank you so much for a fascinating talk. Um, did, did I hear you correctly uh, when you said that, what I thought you said, that the, it was necessary to not just recall the memory, but to be also experience the emotional, the original emotions in order for the memory reconsolidation to work? Yes, that appears to be essential. Okay, so in that case, it seems to me then we shouldn't be just talking about meditation in general, but only very particular kinds of meditation because, you know, something like, you know, deity meditation or meditation where you are looking in a very detached way, you know, as a sort of witness consciousness, as just watching a play, that's not going to do that. So I'm just wondering, are there particular Indian texts that actually do encourage that emotional engagement with the original memories rather than the kind of detached stepping back? Well, the texts say but very, very little about it. Yeah. And of course, emotional engagement may not quite catch the, the, the situation. Remembering an emotional memory does not necessarily mean that you engage with it, because that is precisely the way that traumatic it is yeah, perhaps, continues. Perhaps engagement is a wrong word, but I'm more thinking like a lot of the but meditation practices talk there, about de no. detachment. No. Know, from I think detachment is, yeah. as the text emphasized, quite vital to face the emotions with detachment. Okay, that's interesting. Makes sense? It does. I wonder if they're different things, though. But... Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you for the for this fascinating talk and for lining out these connections. Um, so I don't work with texts, but I'm just um, what came to my mind was 
vipassana the 10 day vipassana course um which uh, for example i was once in, in the interior of andhra pradesh so it was not a nothing in, in the western context and it's like a 10 day um full immersion meditation the first three days are um um concentration on the breath and the next seven days on different parts of the body and uh i noticed how a lot of people after that then they you don't talk you don't read you can't practice yoga um, uh, asanas and so people suddenly had no longer back pain or psoriasis or who just suddenly stopped smoking so if one thinks that psoriasis or back pain could be a somatic response to some traumatic experience i was wondering whether that would fit then into your framework what you have what like whether you think that this could be well here of course the fact that i'm not a psychologist that's going to take revenge on me um i don't really know i know there is there are many ways to improve forms of suffering or to to reduce the suffering um that I may not know the details of, but I do know that there is an extreme form which erases completely uh, traumatic and related memories. And that's what I talked about. That doesn't exclude that your Vipassana meditation um, did a lot of good to the people who practice that. Um, but I think I would really go out of my area of competence if I tried to say more about that. You know, sorry, I, I didn't mean that then only meditation leads to that, but to something then maybe that, as you explained earlier, can allow for even in an unconscious way to touch up on certain memories and then uh, like actuate something. Possible, but memory reconsolidation cannot be unconscious. I see. That's, sort of the, that's the crux of it. It has to be a conscious re activation okay okay that was not clear thank you also thank you yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <clears throat> bearing in mind that the uh sutras are probably a composite text and uh pradeep gokali's book you know a few years ago he pointed out that about 50 percent of the verses come directly from asanga or russell bandhu from yogachara buddhism so we're seeing a, a compilation of techniques, if you like, or practices or insights. And I'm wondering whether what, what you're talking about as this memory retrieval and then the consequent process of eliminating that kind of sanskar is just one practice. Whereas what Daniel was talking about earlier as samadhi being the elimination of the glaciers and so on. And there's another aspect, I think, to the uh, meditation that a full absorption in samadhi is meant to eradicate the sanskaras, like another kind of, it's, it's another another technique, if you like, of erasing sanskaras, not in contradiction to what you're saying, but just as a compilation of techniques. And as for the samadhi being this uh, way of, of cleaning out the unwanted vasanas or whatever, there's again, more corroborative evidence of that with the administration of psychedelics and people suddenly not being traumatized anymore because they've had a, an absorption experience which if you like eliminates the glaciers eliminates the sanskaras and everything else so not as though there's just one technique involved in these practices but several different at least two possible yeah yeah well of course the number of complications here is enormous and i tried to in order to remain intelligible yeah yeah i've stuck to a few uh, lines, but the Buddhists themselves have not one path to um, yeah, yeah, the goal, yeah, yeah. but a number. This is the most frequent one, and, and in a way, perhaps the most authentic, but that, but there are others, and the Buddhists came more and more to emphasize the importance of a liberating insight, which then they try to specify. You have to see this, or you have to understand that, and you have to be eliminated in that. Whereas this does not talk about anything of the kind. And much of what we call Buddhist philosophy is almost like an elaboration of the inside, the deeper transcendental inside, which people thought you have to master. But um, I think that, as I said earlier, I think the Buddhist tradition, I understand the Buddhist tradition of thought largely as an as attempts to make sense of their tradition. Mm -hmm. They didn't know any better than we what all this meant. 
but they tried to make sense of it and they did it in various ways and they came with different answers and um, and yes of course there has all have always been many different ways and practices i would probably think that if this what i've been presenting to you is correct if this is the how the mind works and deals with problematic behaviors and personality things if this is correct then there may be only one way to really erase it there may be many ways in order to make life more or less livable uh, more or less but and it seems this way there may be different practices people may pursue that uh, do something good but not all that much i'm not sure if what you mentioned about psychedelics goes against what i say because psychedelic is very much a matter of becoming conscious of things that are otherwise not conscious and that fits in beautifully with the this particular uh, memory reconsolidation doesn't it okay well thank you very much professor bronco's already taken you over about 10 or 15 minutes past our, our i think we could keep keep going on newer newer and like the sanskaras new and new ones would keep appearing and blocking out the ones that went before um and i and i'm and and it's a, a wonderfully productive synthesis of this uh modern scientific approach with philology which is a bit daunting for us yoga philologists looks like now we're gonna have to explore uh, modern you. psychology as well to try to make sense of our text um so but thank you very much i just before we uh completely set work you know finish off and and, and uh, uh show our appreciation to professor broncos just say that tomorrow evening you're going to be speaking on patanjali mahabharata I can't actually remember. Patanjali, yeah. different, different Patanjali, sorry, Patanjali the grammarian is in here. Is it? Same time, Thank same you, place. Dear. Same time, same place. Uh, and I should also just quickly add that we've got a couple more lectures coming up. Thank you, Theo, has kindly provided me with this list. So on 18th of October, we've got these are all online. I know three online. So Jacob Schmidt Madsen, which looks very exciting, it's about sort of crossover between tantric models of the body in Indian board games in the 18th, 19th century. Then Andrea Akri, 1st of November, Kenji Takahashi on 15th of November, and then our very own Monica Herma on the 28th of November in person. Um, so I hope you'll join us for all of those. But now just once more, thank you so much for such a stimulating uh, lecture. And wonderful that you insisted that you would only present in person because it's so much better. Thank you very much. <laughs>